tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. I live in a small town in America's heartland where nothing much ever happens. People go to work and go to church and everyone pretty much knows everyone else. We all shop at the same stores, send our kids to the same schools. There are picnics at the town square on holidays and seldom do we have a crime more serious than vagrancy. Some might call our little town quaint or even dull. But I would argue that point. It's a trade-off. Maybe we don't have the same opportunity for excitement that many places across the country have, but we don't live in fear either. You can leave your car and your house unlocked if you choose, and you don't have to worry about having any of your stuff stolen. You can walk alone down the street in town, not worry about being attacked or even hassled in any significant way. People can let their children play in their yards without watching them every second. Yeah, it's a trade-off. Excitement for safety. But one we feel a pretty fair bargain. Until lately. Though rather insignificant by most crime standards, about two weeks ago, people's pets started disappearing. I'm not talking about two or three pets over that period. I'm talking about several a day. By last count, there had been 26 pets gone missing. Mostly dogs, but a few cats as well. Curiously, most of the pets had disappeared from their owners' backyards, often fenced in with no apparent points of egress. So it wasn't as though these pets were just wandering off or anything. Also, as far as I know, none of the pets that have gone missing have been found. My neighbor across the street, Mr. Braswell, he's lived in the house for about 40 years. Since his wife passed a few years ago, he's been living there alone. Well, him and his German shepherd. He calls him Soldier. Anyway, Soldier went missing the night before last. I found Mr. Braswell out at his mailbox yesterday morning and he told me what he'd seen of it. He told me that he'd let Soldier out back in his well-fenced yard just before bedtime as he always did. The moon was mostly full so he could see his dog run around the perimeter of the fence towards a back corner. That's when he first saw it. Though he couldn't really explain what it was. He said it was like a large, dark mass, just sort of resting along the back fence. Strangely, though, he said it wasn't something he could discern the details of, but it was more like a space where the moonlight just didn't illuminate. He said he could tell soldiers saw it too because he stopped and looked at it, his tails and ears at attention. He thought he heard soldier growl, and then he'd simply run towards it and disappear inside the black mass, almost like he'd run through a portal. Okay, let me be clear about something. I'm not one to be critical of the elderly, especially of someone who'd served in the military like Mr. Braswell had. But I'd always thought that maybe his faculties weren't what they once were. He was getting on up there in age. I think he was over 90, still. Of all the people who'd lost pets over the last two weeks, he was the first person who'd actually claimed to see it happen. That reason alone was enough for me to feel he ought to at least be listened to. He said he'd called the police and they'd come out and taken his statement. Mr. Braswell said he felt like they hadn't really taken him seriously, though. That they just humored him. I didn't know what to make of that. Like I said, he probably wasn't as sharp as he once was. And the officers who'd come out might have thought that as well. But that didn't mean he hadn't seen what he'd seen. That people's pets were disappearing had long since become a serious area of concern for people in my town. But last night, the seriousness and the concern ratcheted up exponentially. A family two streets over from mine, the Carsons, had a nine-year-old boy named Tommy and a two-year-old poodle named Trixie. Just after supper, apparently, as he often did, young Tommy took Trixie on a walk down to the end of their cul-de-sac. Neither one of them made it back home. 
There were people walking along the route who'd said they'd seen them walking down the sidewalk like normal, nothing seeming the matter. No one had seen anything unusual either, no strange vehicles or loiterers, and obviously no one had seen them abducted. They just vanished, as a cliche goes, without a trace. Clearly, the disappearance of a child had changed things. Fear had come to settle over the community at large. And there was now a visual police presence. Something seldom seen or felt in our little town. I'd heard that the mayor had called for the FBI too, but I hadn't seen any evidence of that. Tonight though, as did all my neighbors, I went home and locked my doors. I have a border collie named Jenna, and I've often thought how glad I was she couldn't talk. If she could, she'd probably prove that she was smarter than I was, which would have been really uncomfortable for both of us. But she couldn't talk. So we went along playing the roles of master and pet. The point, though, is that she was a very smart dog. The smartest dog I'd ever been around. It must have been sometime around midnight when Jenna woke me. It had been a while since I'd let her out to go to the bathroom. I stumbled towards the back door, but then I remembered about everything that had been going on. Still, I knew she had to pee, so in spite of the fact that there was a full moon, I grabbed my flashlight and I took it out with us. It didn't take me long to see it, almost exactly as I'd imagined it when Mr. Braswell had described what he'd seen. There was a dark space just to the right of my patio. A space where the light just didn't seem to go. It was larger than I'd imagined. Maybe 10 to 15 feet square. I couldn't tell for sure because it wasn't static. It seemed to move, expand, and contract, keeping me from getting a fix on it. I reflexively turned on my flashlight, and I shined at the darkness. And the entire thing lit up, like someone had put a lit candle inside a paper bag. I felt fear, but I felt awe as well. Looking at this thing that just didn't appear to be from our world, I was mesmerized. I had sort of lost track of what was going on, only managing to wonder what this thing could possibly be. Jenna had been sitting on her haunches next to me, but by the time I came back to the moment, she'd stood and walked several places towards the thing. I moved the flashlight's beam to her. She looked back at me over her shoulder and I yelled for her to get away. Jenna! To come back to me. But then she just trotted forward and disappeared into the darkness. I yelled something. I don't remember what, but before I realized what I was doing, I started to run after her. But by the time I'd reached the thing's perimeter, my innate fear had taken hold and I'd begun trying to stop my forward progress. It was too late, though. I at least partially crossed the thing's edge, and what I saw, it was almost indescribable. There was a vast landscape stretched out before me, a desert landscape beneath a bright, silvery sky, and it felt nothing like being in the real world. Everything was fluid, like it was made from paper or flames maybe, and was being blown and stretched by a stiff wind. Even my own hands and arms appeared distorted in that same way as I looked down at them. It was disorienting. The landscape was mostly devoid of color as well. Everything appeared in varying shades of grays and whites, as though it was being washed out by the brightness of the light. There was a constant noise too, like the rush of water or a steady wind causing everything to sound and feel fuzzy. I don't know how long I was in that place. A second, a minute, a day. All I know is that I found myself tumbling onto my backside there on the patio. The dark thing still looming over me. I can't say if I'd managed to lurch backwards somehow or if the thing had simply expelled me, but I was out. Jenna, however, was still in. Otherwise, everything seemed eerily calm and quiet. There was no wind, 
No leaves rustling in the trees. No animal noises at all. No sounds from any of my neighbor's houses. It was like I was all alone. Like that's how the dark thing wanted me. And I could feel adrenaline beginning to pulse through my veins. Probably out of fear, I switched my flashlight back on and shined it at the dark thing. As before, it lit up in a muted peach-colored glow. Also, there came a sound from it. A distant sound that seemed to move closer over time. Soon enough, I could tell what that sound was. It was Jenna. She was barking from somewhere inside that vast landscape, the fiery, colorless desert I'd seen with my own eyes. Somehow, existing within this relatively small space in my backyard. I felt a rush of excitement or anxiety or something. No matter, my dog was lost somewhere inside that thing and I wanted her out. I rationalized that it would be foolish for me to go back in because then we'd both be lost, just like the rest of the pets and just like young Tommy. So, instead of venturing in, I called to her, loud as I could, over Jenna. and over, Jenna. and then I stopped to listen. Sure enough, before long, I heard her reply. She was getting closer too. I could tell from the sound that she was getting closer. Probably from my excitement over her drawing near, I managed to move the beam from the dark thing. Naturally, the illumination went away, but so did Jenna's barking. Somehow, I knew, I knew right then and there that the light was the key. The beam of light was the portal into and out of the dark space. I hurriedly shone the light back at the thing. It lit back up, and I could once again hear Jenna. I kept calling to her over and over. She kept replying, sometimes seeming farther away, but sometimes closer. Finally, though, after what seemed like a long time of calling, she sounded like she had to have been right next to the edge of the darkness. Like she was just a few feet away from me. She wouldn't come out, though. She wouldn't cross over and come back into our world. Without giving it too much thought, I found myself moving back towards the darkness. Once I got to the edge, I reached my hand in. How bizarre to see your hand and arm disappear right in front of you. I reached around but could feel nothing. I kept calling to Jenna though, and she kept barking. There came a point, however, when it sounded like she was moving away, so probably out of panic. I forced myself through the dark's outer edge, and I re-entered the fluid, colorless world. To my immense belief, standing right before me was Jenna, her reddish fur seemingly ablaze in the cosmic distortion. I called to her, and she barked a reply though I could scarcely hear either of us. Over the rushing sounds from this strange world, she ran to me though, she ran to me though, she ran and she leapt towards my chest, and the next thing I knew, the both of us were tumbling on the grass of my backyard. I scooped her up, and I gave her a big hug, and she replied with a multitude of licks across my face, but then, like we'd remembered at the same time, we looked towards the dark thing. It had moved. It was still moving, in fact, towards the back of my yard. I seemed to have lost my flashlight, so I couldn't track it with light, but we watched. It moved down into the wooded gulch behind my fence row, and then it ascended towards the sky and over my neighbor's roof. Eventually, it moved too far away for us to see, its shrinking profile blending into the night sky. We went back inside, Jenna and I, and I was intending to call 911 straight away. I found my phone and started to dial, but something made me hesitate. What was I going to say? That my dog and I had been inside a dark blob that appeared in my backyard? That it was actually a portal to another universe? And I'd somehow managed to save my dog from it? Was that my story? It took me about two seconds to decide. Of course, it was my story. It's what had happened. 
My guess was that this dark thing had been lurking around our town for the last several weeks, and it was responsible for all the disappearances. Would people think I was crazy or that I was just trying to get attention? Sure, some would, but some wouldn't. The way I figured it, if people knew what to look for, they'd be more likely to find it, or for some, to avoid it. Either way, from my perspective, it was imperative that the thing be found. I'm an animal lover, so that several dozen pets had disappeared these last few weeks would be enough reason for me, just as it would for a lot of my fellow townspeople. But there was a higher calling here. Tommy Carson was in that thing, or place, or whatever it was. I knew it in my bones. And if I could make it back with Jenna, Tommy Carson could be found and brought back as well. Jenna was standing next to my chair, looking at me expectantly. I gave her a head, a quick rub, feeling immensely grateful that she was with me, that she was as smart as she was, and then pressed the send button on my phone. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Dear Sir, I won't pretend to feel anything other than a deep dread at the receipt of your letter. How you came by my name and of my involvement in the mentioned incident causes me a great deal of consternation. Considering the effort I've made over the years to hide my presence at the event. As you correctly stated, I was indeed in Visay when the hikers passed through. After some little trouble with local government in my hometown, I was spending time there on the down low, as I understand the expression is. I had not met the group before, but we had a chance to meet during the purchasing of food and I found them friendly and forthcoming. And I'll admit that their little expedition seemed an enjoyable one to me, though I had not their experience in climbing and mountaineering. My hesitation on whether to join them or not originally led me to start out alone on my own journey, on a somewhat parallel route, though with a different destination. But I found myself oddly drawn to that intriguingly determined little group, and so eventually changed my mind and my path. They had taken the first part of their journey quite easily and I was able to catch up with them in the Highland area around, I believe, the 31st, after Uden had already departed the expedition due to injury. The lone female member of the group, Liudmila, seemed pleased to have more female company and the group as a whole welcomed me as a friend. It warmed my heart. After all, I could have no idea what was to come. The first sign that the journey would not be what we hoped was the worsening weather conditions, sharp snowstorms that destroyed our visibility, and as a less experienced hiker, I found this quite disconcerting, but the rest of the group were made of sturdier stuff and were not so phased. Even when it transpired that we had become a little lost and had deviated from our path, finding ourselves towards the top of the Kolat. They merely decided that we should set up camp, Igor stating that it would be a good practice of slope camping and not wanting to lose the height we had conquered. Oh, that we had been more cautious, been less eager. Despite the presence of women in the group, we shared one tent between the ten of us and practicality being far more important in the circumstances than propriety. It was actually Lyudmila that woke up first that night, her movement waking me. Can, can you hear that, Veta? she asked, and the concern in her voice made me hesitate. In the silence of the night for several moments, all I could hear was the gentle breathing of our companions. And then 
There was a crunch of snow outside and a sharp noise like the heavy breath of a large animal. A bear, perhaps, though we were aware of nothing like it in the area. Lyudmila and myself, we froze. Our eyes locked together and then she reached over and gripped Igor's arm. His eyes opened blearily and focused on us, and I saw his expression grow puzzled as he watched me press a finger to my lips. Huh? What? He sat up carefully and he stared at us, a question on his face. In answer, I just pointed to where the sound seemed to be coming from. It was closer now, and whatever it was seemed to have its face pressed to the side of the tent as I could hear it sniffing along the bottom of the material. I was aware of the other members of the group awakening, slowly sitting up, their bodies still and silent as they heard the thing outside investigating us. I don't know what we all felt at that moment. Some fear, certainly, but perhaps not terror. A large animal does not necessarily mean a predator, after all, and our tent was sturdy in any case. I caught Igor's eye, and his calmness soothed me. The thing outside was moving around towards the front of the tent, towards the opening that we believed to be securely tied. And then, the noise. Oh God, the noise! I can't describe it fully. Something like a scream, but furious. Somehow high-pitched and shrieking, and yet with some lower rumble of bass that seemed to make the ground shake beneath us. There were cries of fear within the group, and we grasped each other. At my side, and absolutely terrified, Yuri snatched his knife out of his bag and he slashed it through the side of the tent. The slit he made was easily big enough for him to fit through, and he fled out of it, followed quickly by Giorgi. As the thing outside pushed against the front of the tent, the rest of us surged forward towards this escape route, briefly bottlenecking, whilst behind us that awful roar grew louder, and then we were free, and fleeing down the slopes towards the nearest shelter we could find. I don't know how long we ran, freezing, terrified and pursued by that creature before we saw the woods ahead of us and we barreled in. We scrambled into bushes and up trees breathless and trying to make each other out in the darkness as well as to see if that thing had followed. There was silence around us and I think we all dared to hope that we had escaped. But whatever elation could have been in store for us was quickly dashed by the realization of our situation. We were outside, in the freezing cold, most of us without shoes even, and with no way to find our way back to the dark, to our belongings. I, I'm not sure how long we cowered there before we realized that we were going to have to at least attempt to return back the way we came. Georgie and Yuri were already beginning to succumb to the first signs of hypothermia. I heard Zaneda shushing Yuri, who was shaking violently and hissing about his bare feet. There were hushed discussions of starting a fire, but I think we were scared that it would bring the creature back to us. Gold. Igor made the decision that the rest of us would stay in the woods, while he, Zaneda, and Rustam would attempt to return to the tent to fetch clothing and provisions. They left soon after. We never saw them again. After several hours, Nikolai urged us to start at least a small fire if we didn't want to lose Yuri and Georgie, who were huddled at the bottom of a pine, deathly pale. Yuri had already tried to remove his clothes once. I'm sure that many of your education is aware of paradoxal undressing. Though Lyudmila had managed to stop him, Semyon agreed and we collected firewood and attempted a blaze, though without much luck, never really managing more than a sputtering failure. And after Yuri suddenly jerked his leg, knocking the fire out and singeing his trousers in the process, 
despite the bitter weather, we gave up. But you have to be practical in these circumstances, you see. So when Yuri and Georgie were seen to not need them anymore, we took their clothing. Their troubles were over. It was Alexander who first stated that he did not believe that Igor and the others would be returning and that if we wanted to survive this, we would need to set out on our own. Those of us that remained, myself, Lyudmila, Nikolai, and Semyon, had to agree. We were on our own. We set out carefully and quietly as we could, thinking to follow in the footsteps of Igor and the others and make our way back to the tent. We stayed close together, eyes wide and staring out into the darkness. That we had already lost our way only became apparent when moonlight burst out from behind a cloud and shone down on a gaping ravine that none of us could remember on our flight down from the tent to relative safety. Should we turn back? whispered Alexander to the rest of us, but before any of us could answer, Nikolai glanced behind us and let out an awful cry. I don't believe the rest of us looked to see what he had seen. We had a good idea after all, but instead just ran as fast as we could away from it. In the panic, Nikolai, terrified by what he'd seen, stumbled the wrong way, and I saw him disappear over the nearby edge. Lyudmila screamed at that and immediately changed her course to a path that led towards the ravine and down, perhaps hoping that we could somehow save him. Semyon, Alexander, and I followed her. There was nowhere to hide up here after all. We ran and slipped our way down to the creek at the bottom, but there was no time to look for Nikolai. The creature had followed us. We could hear its fast footsteps and its grumbling growl. I tried to sneak a look over my shoulder as I ran, but could only make out a shadowy shape in the darkness. Our group found itself splitting up, each trying to make different cover. I saw Lyudmila make for a group of boulders whilst I lunged for a large shrub growing stubbornly by the freezing water. I didn't see at that time where Alexander went. Once hidden, I turned to see if the creature had seen me, might perhaps even now be bearing down on me, but it was not. Semyon had slipped in the water and he was trying to drag himself away. I could hear his whimpering and cries from where I hid. I could also see the creature for the first time. It was tall and thin. Human-like, I guess, but wrong in too many ways. In the moonlight, I could make out unnaturally long limbs, jutting bones. Its face wasn't too clear, though I thought I could make out dark holes where eyes and mouth might be. It was bearing down on Semyon, who had twisted round to face his attacker. Brave man. The thing leaned down towards him and screamed. The noise was worse than before, again with that strange split of high and low resonance. With wide eyes, I saw Semyon's face contort in pain. And then I looked away, squeezing my eyes shut. I heard a dull crack, like the crunch of bones, and then silence. I peered out. Semyon was slumped back in the water. Dead, I had no doubt. The thing was standing where I'd seen it last, its back to me. It was unnaturally still, like a statue. I glanced over to the boulders where I had seen Lyudmila, and I saw her, peeping out as I was, her eyes on the monster. I realized immediately that she intended to run. Her cover was not as good as mine, and it was as apparent to her as to me that if the creature turned her way, she would not be hidden. She carefully moved back. Whether the creature had supernatural hearing or some other unknown sense, 
I turned immediately. Those dark holes of eyes seeking lead Mila out. She screamed and turned to run, but good God, it moved so fast. Those freakish limbs eating up the ground between them, its spidery hands grabbing her arms, pulling her up in the air. For a second, it just stared at her face as she writhed in its grip and then gave its banshee wail. This time, I didn't look away. Though sheer terror has purged much of what I saw from my mind, but before I fainted, I remembered seeing her eyes and how they poured down her face. How I survived until morning, I'll never know. Though three fingers and most of my toes were the price I paid to the cold, I was luckier, though, than Alexander, who was found further down the creek, frozen, face down in the water, as it lapped gently against him. Of the creature, there was no sign. I made no attempt to return to the tent, and would likely have perished like my companions had I not eventually stumbled upon a somewhat shocked tribe of Mansi, who saved my life, and to whom... I am forever indebted. Until today, I have never shared this story. My status as a fugitive from the law would have made me unwilling to divulge my involvement, even if the story had not been so unbelievable and the government so eager to cover up what aspects of it they could. Though mostly, it's because I do not wish to relive it. I've had such nightmares as it is of the creature, of Liedmila's face, and of the details I learned later from the investigations. The families don't need to know what truly occurred. Let them believe it was just an unfortunate accident. I know enough of you, sir, to have no reason to believe in your goodness. But I'm an old woman now. Who is not likely to see many more summers. If I could prevail on you to keep this account hidden until I am no longer around to confirm nor deny it, then you would be doing me a great kindness. Let the dead rest, sir. Though from what I know of you, I fear my pleas fall on deaf ears. Yours. Elizaveta Sokolova. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. August 8th, 1991. The cultists calling themselves Bal Deva's Truth had become so efficient at home invasions that neither of Samantha's parents were able to call the police before they died. The firefighters with Engine 21 were the first emergency responders on the scene, and I was one of them that night. We arrived only after the neighbors called in reports that smoke was pouring out of the house's front windows and by then it was mostly too late to stop the cultists' plan. Most of Baldeva's truth had already committed suicide, to spare themselves from burning alive. We only learned that they had been there when we found their bodies piled in the home's main foyer. We called for police as soon as we saw the corpses, but the billowing smoke urged us to continue inside without waiting for backup to arrive. The flames would soon begin to attack the building's structure. If it hadn't started to do so already, we had to press our way inside if we were going to contain the still spreading blaze. Otherwise, it would soon threaten more than just this house alone. I remember being sure of arson as soon as I was inside. The fire had been fed deliberately, and it had been built so that it might spread easily to their neighbors' homes as well. We moved past the bodies in the foyer, in a frenzy to save the building. 
I remember feeling vulnerable without the police there. I was acutely aware that we firefighters might be attacked by anyone who was still alive in the house. We heard from the emergency report that a family of three was expected to be inside, two parents and an infant. The dispatcher's voice on our radios had specified. After the night of the incident, I did some research on the family in that house. I just couldn't get them out of my head. And so I learned later that the couple had just moved into town to begin raising their child. We found both parents bound to the heavy wooden chairs that they had bought for the dining room. Even though their bodies were already burning by the time we fought our way in to the center of the house. It was plain to see that their hearts had been messily cut out of their chests. Their faces, too looked to have been mutilated before the fire began. It was then that I realized that there was no baby present in the dining room there with the parents. She might still be alive. And so I sent my partner to the second floor, while I headed down to the wine cellar by myself. It was down at the bottom of the cellar stairs that I first saw Max Kafer, the leader of the cultists, heard me enter and he turned to face me with the baby in his arms. Kafer had eyes like dying coals that were nearly drowned in the wet suit of his face. My fire axe was gripped in my hands, and I would have buried it in his chest had he not held the baby up in front of him. We're summoning a demon tonight, he told me flatly. It's mostly done already. He held the baby up as though he was going to throw it against the ground. While his arms were still raised, I dropped my axe and tackled Max Kiefer around his midsection. We fell together, but I managed to seize the baby gently from him before he hit the ground. Max rose up to take the child back, but I struck him hard with my fist and he went down again. This time he stayed there, unconscious but not dead. The police would arrive minutes later to collar him, along with the two cultists that were still alive upstairs. My partner did not survive finding those cultists up there first, though. To this day, I wonder why I sent him up there instead of going myself. The baby had been named Samantha by her parents, and that name was honored and kept when the child passed into foster care. I would have adopted her myself, except that I was entirely unprepared to raise a child at that time. I bought Samantha gifts on her birthday, though, and I visited the foster home on holidays to make the child feel that she still had a family. She grew to know my face, and she learned to trust me as the years passed. It was something like fatherly love that I felt for her in return, even though we weren't truly family to each other. Max Kafer went to prison, as did two of his followers who survived that night inside the burning house. They were the ones who killed my partner after I sent him to the second floor. To this day, I wish I had been better prepared to protect baby Samantha. More than that, though, I wish that I'd killed Max Kafer with my axe while I still had the chance. February 17th. 2001. Her amber alert interrupted the evening news and I recognized Samantha immediately. I searched the internet, investigating the terrible suspicions that were already creeping into my mind. After only a few minutes of research, I confirmed my worst fear. Max Kafer had recently been released from prison. Kafer's few surviving followers from that night claimed full responsibility for the murders and the arson. The only charges that stuck to Kafer were three counts of aiding and abetting. In the end, Max Kafer served less than ten years in prison due to good behavior while he was inside. He was a free man again, and I suddenly felt sure that I knew where Samantha could be found tonight. I knew who had taken her away. The burned-out house was condemned but still standing. 
urban blight in the area had left the property in limbo, awaiting a demolition that was now almost a decade overdue. I arrived at that scene of that same 1991 arson just in time to see two figures entering the smashed down doorway to the main foyer. It looked like a man and a child. I used my cell phone to call the police and report what I was seeing, but I couldn't just stand around while I was waiting for them to arrive. Samantha might be killed by the time that emergency responders made it to the house, and I did not want to be standing idly outside if my suspicions about Max Kafer were correct. The smell of gasoline hit me hard as I entered the house. Accelerant fumes were already heavy in the air and I knew immediately that Max was trying to finish what he started ten years ago. He wanted to burn the house to the ground once and for all. The entry foyer was different now, but it still brought up bad memories. There were no piles of dead bodies here anymore. Instead, there were only fire-damaged floorboards beneath my boots and countless oily slicks of gasoline zigzagging through the house. I thought immediately of the wine cellar. That's where Kafer meant to kill Samantha, and that is where he would likely go now. I moved quickly but carefully from the foyer to the dining room. As I passed through it, I saw that the dining room had changed too. No longer were the desecrated bodies of Sam's parents tied to heavy wooden chairs around the table. Instead, this room was empty now. As I squinted in the darkness, I realized that all four walls around me were covered from floor to ceiling with insane ramblings about Baldeva and the little girl. It was then that I realized that Max Kafer had likely been preparing this place for tonight's ritual ever since he got out of prison. I remember that cellar door was just beyond where I stood now. As I hurried forward, I did my best to muffle the sound of my footsteps. I did not want to alert Kiefer to my approach. I was also forced to hesitate as I reached the cellar door. It wasn't clear whether the damaged woodwork reinforcing those stairs could still support my weight. If the stairway collapsed underneath me, I would certainly be too badly injured from the fall to stop Kafer. Testing the top stair with one foot, I felt it shift gently beneath my boot. The woodwork below me let out a soft creak in response to my weight. I cautiously brought my other foot to bear on that same top step. There were no sounds of anything cracking or splintering below. Taking a deep breath, I began my descent into the cellar. Moving down the stairs, I found Kafer standing at the bottom with his back turned to me. Samantha was huddled against a far corner of the cellar, crying and trying to make herself small there. It pained me to see her so afraid, but I was also greatly relieved to find that she was still alive. Sam was hiding her face against her knees and pressing her eyes closed as she shielded them with the folded crook of her arm. Because she was crying this way, she did not see me coming into the cellar. Kafer also did not notice that I had descended the stairs behind him. He was rambling as though trying to drown out a voice that only he could hear. It was clear that Max Kafer had lost the last vestiges of his sanity during the time in prison. The man's deranged mind had plainly continued deteriorating over the ten years since I last saw him. Mixed in with the rambling, Max was telling Samantha that she needed to cooperate with him. He was telling her with anger in his voice that she did not need to be afraid. I'm sorry for what happened to your parents, little girl. We were trying to summon Baldeva, and we did summon him. I regret it now, he began chuckling dryly. (laughs) I regret it. I regret it so much. He turned his head and seemed to shout to an unseen third party there in the cellar. Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! It was clear that Max still had not noticed me behind him. Was he talking to a demon? I searched for a weapon and I found that there was nothing within my reach. 
If it came to a sudden moment of decisive violence, could I really strangle this man with my bare hands? Another strong whiff of gasoline stung my nostrils and reminded me that the house was already fully staged to transform into an inferno. If Kafer began reaching into his pocket for some matches or a lighter, then I would only have seconds to neutralize him. Max took a deep breath, as though to calm himself, and then continued talking to Samantha. Little girl, we really did summon Baldeva. He went into me, and for ten years he's been living inside my brain. I can't endure it anymore. Do you understand? That's why we're here. To reverse the spell tonight. Shut up! Shut up! He turned his head again to shout at the invisible third party that he apparently sensed nearby. In his frustration, Kafer reached into his unkempt hair and briskly tore a fistful of it out. If we finish what we started, Max said, then Beldeva can go somewhere else. He can go anywhere else. I could hear in his voice that Kiefer was beginning to cry. The madman's defenses were lowered, and yet fear of the unknown stayed my hand. I had no way to be sure whether Max was armed with some sort of concealed weapon. If I were to attack at the wrong moment, I might doom both Samantha and myself by letting Kiefer get the upper hand. Max Kiefer began moving subtly towards Samantha. She was still huddled in that corner, trying to hide herself from the reality that was now marching towards her. It was then that I lost all concern for myself. If Max had a knife, then he could try to stick it into me now. I took three careful steps forward, and then I wrapped my fingers around his neck with all of the force that I could muster, wrenching Kafer by the back of his neck. I threw him to the ground with all of my strength. Max had not sensed me there behind him, and so he was completely unprepared to defend himself. Kafer barely caught himself from falling flat onto his face as he went down, and in his confusion he remained prostrate against the ground for several seconds before he began moving to collect himself back up. Standing over Max Kafer, I raised my leg and then brought my boot down hard against the back of his head. I stomped again, this time driving my boot into the exposed curve of spine at the back of his neck. I put my full weight into each strike that I delivered to the downed man. I kicked him hard three more times before I stopped to check whether or not Max was even still breathing. He wasn't. It was at this point that I noticed the bladed weapon that Kafer had been holding. It was a serrated knife with a keenly honed edge, and it must have been palmed tightly in Max's right hand when he first started walking towards Sam. Samantha finally uncovered her face, sensing perhaps that something important had just happened. Sam looked up to see me standing there in front of her, and she recognized my face immediately despite her gladness to be saved. I could tell that her terror had not subsided. Samantha had previously only known me as a source of gifts and kindness. Now instead, she saw me looming over the broken body of a man that I had just killed. I saw her eyes change to reflect something frightening and cold. It was a look unlike any expression that I'd ever seen on Samantha's face before. We waited outside for the police together, and when they arrived, I did my best to explain everything that had happened. For the most part, it felt like a relatively happy ending to an otherwise completely terrifying evening. Samantha had undeniably been changed by something, though. The way that her eyes turned cold and harsh that night never went away either. Any time that I visited Sam after the events of that night, her eyes invariably held that same expression of strange detachment. Her personality became pitiless in ways that it had never been before. Was Samantha badly traumatized by what she'd been through that night? Or was it something else? 
I am not a superstitious man, but I think something strange must have happened when Max Kafer died. I remember checking his pulse while we were still down there in the wine cellar. I made sure that there was no shadow of a heartbeat for me to find on any of his pulse points. When the EMTs arrived, they naturally did their best to resuscitate Max anyway. Maybe they were successful in forcing his heart to beat a few more times before they moved him to the ambulance. That's the only rational explanation I could have for what I saw at the end of the night. Kafer's eyes opened as they were carting him off, and his head turned almost imperceptibly on his badly broken neck to stare directly at me. They had put Max's body on a stretcher, and then brought him out through the front door while I was still talking to the police. The dead man's eyes tracked me that whole time, adjusting their angle as the paramedics passed me on their way to the ambulance. Was there really a demon inside Max Kafer? He said that the ritual was meant to cast the demon out of his brain and to send it anywhere else. If Baldeva is real, then where did it go? Could it have gone into Samantha? It feels crazy to even think about this, but her eyes are just so fiercely cold now. Even if there's a demon inside that child, I love her like one of my own. I will protect her forever. God damn you, Max Kiefer. Burn in hell. August 8th. 2011. Samantha left foster care as soon as she turned 18. She'd never managed to find a permanent family to adopt her. In a few cases, she was almost taken in by a family. But her behavior always caused the prospective parents to reconsider before the papers were signed. Apparently, this was usually because Samantha spoke earnestly during adoption interviews about the demon living inside of her. I haven't run into her since she aged out of the foster care program. Sam must have changed her name and moved away, because I never see her around town or hear from her at all. I'm retired now. I don't fight fires anymore, and I never ended up with a family of my own. They say that time makes fools of all of us, and I guess I've become a prime example of that old adage being true. I'm just a lonely old man now, and like most lonely old men, I often think of the people I helped a long time ago. I tear myself apart sometimes, wondering about why nobody else seems to remember me like I remember them. Seems like all the times I visited Samantha in foster care, she would have at least thought to check in on me now, or she could have easily written me a letter but she never has. I've only seen Sam once since she turned 18 and honestly wish that I hadn't. I was enjoying a long walk one evening when I saw her. It had been 20 years to the day since that terrible evening when her parents were killed, but she was saved. I remember smelling coarse smoke in the air before I noticed her there. Something nearby was burning. It was then that I recognized her. Samantha was hurrying down the sidewalk in the opposite direction as I had been walking. She was pacing quickly towards me with a broad, bright smile across her face. Her eyes were still empty and cold, despite the grin on her face. She seemed alertly cruel and strangely detached from reality. In that same distinctive way which I remembered from her last years in foster care. In my gladness to see her, I momentarily forgot that smell of smoke wafting over the wind was beginning to choke me. I held up my arms for a hug and yelled, Sam! She continued hustling forward with empty eyes and a detached smile, as though she had not heard me as she got closer. She avoided me standing there on the sidewalk and brushed past me like she didn't know me at all. Samantha! I called after her. 
standing there with my empty arms still extended. I was truly heartbroken to think that she somehow did not know my face after everything we've been through. Without a word, Sam continued around the corner and was gone. I continued walking in the same direction I'd been going before. I felt dazed by my sudden encounter with Samantha and I didn't know what to make of it. I realized suddenly that that acrid smell of smoke was growing more powerful as I moved in the direction from when Samantha had appeared. As I moved forward, I could see the flames. A house was burning. There was a commotion of lights from parked emergency vehicles outside. I drew closer. The police had secured the perimeter and they would not let me approach any nearer than where I had approached to stand. Go home, pal said the officer blocking my path. He held a flat palm to my chest. We're doing our best here already, and I doubt you're prepared to lend a hand. I used to be a firefighter, I answered honestly. But you're right. I'm too old to help anyone now. I pressed the officer for more information. Please, I said. Just tell me that everyone inside the house made it out okay. Before the officer could respond, wild screaming pierced through the clamor and chaos of the fire. It came from the top level of the burning house. I gasped in disbelief. It was horrifying to realize that someone alive remained inside that inferno, and they were still trapped upon that second floor despite so much emergency response on the scene. There's people still inside, I cried out. Why the hell aren't they getting near the windows? They could try to jump down. The firefighters would catch them. At least get some fresh air from outside while they're waiting for the emergency responders to reach them. We think someone must have tied up the family inside before they set fire. The officer answered me matter-of-factly. His eyes cracked open slightly wider as he realized that he had probably said too much. Now get lost, he ordered. We're doing our best to get them out. Another fit of strangled wailing rang out from the house's second floor, and then faded into the crackling sounds of the fire. It was arson then, I said to myself. More demonic rituals. Taking one last helpless glimpse back towards the inferno, I turned around and went home. Back inside my own house, I locked the door behind me and then moved immediately to sit on my couch. I needed a moment to process everything that I had just seen. I didn't turn on any of the lights in my living room, and I left the television in front of me blank and inactive as well. I held the TV's remote in my hand, but I hesitated to turn the television on. There was a cocoon of darkness and silence wrapped around me in this instant and I could feel it shielding me from the horrifying realities that were just outside this impermanent bubble of isolation. My dread urged me to turn on the TV and start watching the news, but I didn't. I knew that I would regret learning anything more about this latest horrible case of arson in my neighborhood. A terrible realization arrived suddenly and it sent a new shudder of repulsion through my body. I realized that watching the news might also help me to understand the details of why Samantha was here in town tonight. She'd been missing until she appeared suddenly tonight, the anniversary of her parents' deaths. More than that, she had returned only to be seen hurrying away from the scene of a deadly arson. Samantha knew me for most of her whole life. She always recognized me right away, but tonight, she didn't seem to know who I was at all. It just didn't make any sense to me, unless a grim thought came suddenly into my mind. I remembered the way that Sam's eyes had changed on the night that I killed Max Kafer. Was it Baldeva that crossed my path tonight? Could it really have been a demon that was looking through Samantha's eyes as she marched past me with that smile on her face? I called Sam's name twice as she walked away, 
There had been no response at all. The woman that I had watched grow up for so many years truly didn't seem to know her own name anymore. Or if she did know it, then it no longer meant anything important to her. Max Kafer had been tortured to insanity by the demon. But in all the years since I first saw the change in Sam's eyes, she didn't seem to feel tortured by anything. During those last visits I made to the foster home before she turned 18 and skipped town, Samantha only seemed more and more ruthless. She had turned into something effortlessly sinister. I think that Samantha truly doesn't mind Bald Deva's presence inside of her. Maybe she's simply more receptive to demonic things than Max Kafer ever managed to be. The more I think about it, the more I realize that Sam must like having Bald Deva in her life. If she didn't like the demon so much, then she surely would have turned to me at least once and asked me for help in making it go away. She never, ever mentioned it to me. Whenever I would visit, I saw in Samantha only a dark confidence that was steadily and silently growing. She allowed herself to sink into a deep ruthlessness of spirit, and she would not acknowledge to me that the transformation was happening. I turn the TV's remote over in my hand as I think about the possibilities. Sam had been smiling so brightly as she walked past me. She was happy as she fled the scene of that burning house with those victims still bound inside. I take a deep breath. I finally made my decision. I stand up from my chair to toss the remote down where I had been sitting. I've already lost the closest thing that I've ever had to a daughter, and I refuse to suffer any more because of what that damned Max Kiefer brought into Sam's life. Even if Samantha decides that she wants to keep killing and drifting from town to town with Baldeva inside her head, then I could never try to stop her. I already promised myself a long time ago that I would protect Samantha. That means that I can't hunt her down or turn her in. Even if she's still out there sowing chaos and hurting innocent people, I won't turn on the news tonight or tomorrow night for that matter. I'll plug my ears when I hear a radio and I won't read the papers for at least a week. In fact, I might never read them again. I don't want to learn about what Samantha's done tonight, and I refuse to think about what she might do next. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights I'm calling it Black Vein Blues. It, it makes sense if you think about it. About a month ago, it started, slow and quiet. I had just come home from school to find my father prodding at the corpse of a gator that washed up on the bank a couple of paces from our home. At that time, I'd been furious, thinking his redneck ass had killed it even in spite of the numerous charges he'd get slapped with for killing a protected species. It was only when I approached it did I realize just how bad it was. The thing was bloated and pale, with ink-black webbing sprouting just under the skin. My father had been prodding it with the tail end of a fire poker, so the belly of it had opened and spilled onto the ground. Its guts, a grease-black spill on the deadened grass. I remember retching at the sight and smell turning away and cursing out loud for my father to get the fuck away from it. He hadn't been too happy to hear his own spawn yelling at him like he was a simple fool. So I ended up being charged with cleaning the thing off our property. 
but only after he skinned it to sell the leather once he finished up. He never got to sell it. He didn't last that long. Later that evening, after a long shower, I'd gone up to the store to buy some things for dinner. Nothing big or costly, so it only took me a half hour to get the ship and hike back. I remember the store had been eerily silent. All of the other customers lost in some sort of daze. Some didn't even notice when I knocked directly into them, their glassy eyes flying to me and then back to whatever they were focused on. I wrote it up for being a sign of the times, what with the pre-existing illness racking the land long before this one ever touched our lands. The cashier had just been about the only person with half of their wits, but only enough to warn me to look out for sick people on my way back to the house. Little did I know I would find out just what she meant the moment I entered my driveway. There my father was, stood in the center of the road completely nude and coated in inky black blood. It was like something out of a horror movie. His eyes had reflected in the shine of the headlights, already dead, focused. Dad, what the fuck is wrong with you? I had asked. Throwing open the car door and stepping, something stopped me then. Self-preservation, probably. An instinct buried within my mind that warned me not to go near the man drooling ropes of blood and mucus. It was a good thing, too, because when he let out that animal shriek and lunged for me, I had enough time to get right back into the car and slam the door behind me before he hit the metal behind me. He was so maddened that he slammed his face over and over into the window, not five inches from my face, blurring the glass with the blackened blood. I was so petrified. I didn't even think for a minute, just staring at that thing that had once been my father as it gored itself against the windows of our old truck. My call to the cops had been frantic, and I'd... I almost thought they might not believe me until the operator let me know someone would be coming up to check the property in the next couple of minutes. I wanted to scream at them, to hurry, but I simply shut my eyes and I prayed the windows held up. Then, as if it knew what I had done, it just stopped. I could see its white milky eyes through the haze on my windows, watching me intently. It was the closest I'd ever been able to observe one of them. I saw what the disease did to their body, bleeding through their skin and veins, until it looked like they were coated with blackened cobwebs. They no longer had pupils or eye color really replaced by bluish milk-white circles that shot from side to side as their blind gazes sought out who knows what in the dark. He was so still and calm that for a second I had thought he might have come too, but then its broken jaw opened wide enough to hit its chest, and it let out a shriek that pierced the night and shook the entire car before it turned and sped into the wild. I hadn't seen him since. Not in the trees, not in the town. It was as if he had disappeared off the face of the earth. The cops had arrived an hour later, but he was already gone. And so they left with a shake of their head, muttering about crazed teenagers. I wonder if they knew what they were going to be walking right back into when they got home later that night. My father hadn't been the only one affected leading me to believe that it wasn't the gator that turned him mad. In 24 hours, the town had gone from normal to complete chaos. The disease had taken over, turning a good portion of our population into drooling monsters. It attacks your mind first, is what I think happens. Your brain overheats, scrambling like eggs in a hot skillet and leaving behind something mindless and violent. Not quite like turning into a zombie, but close enough to where some of the townsfolk went by those old rules. 
and he bites, and you get a bullet to the head. I witnessed that myself on day three. Just when I had been brave enough to venture out into the silence, needless to say, I stopped traveling out in the open after that. From what little I could gather, the town went completely nuts. The same people turned right into something out of an atypical apocalypse movie, where the people went right into savage mode in order to keep order. Law enforcement had been quick to interfere, but only enough to establish themselves as kings of the castle and wall off any resources the rest of the townsfolk may need. From what I had heard from the one actually sane person I'd met, that they had put away some of the people affected with Black Vein in the jail cells to experiment with. I shuddered at the thought of what that might mean. Still, that wasn't the worst of it. You know that phrase, the one popularized by modern movies and media, what if humans were the real bad guy? God, they were so wrong. Nothing could compare to what those things were doing. You see, the difference between them and zombies is that they still are entirely human. Or at least, think like them. Even as they turn into slobbering, rage-infested creatures, they still have the presence of mind to hunt. I'm lucky enough to have witnessed it before I got caught into one of their traps. In the middle of the night, one day I had decided to use the darkness in order to head into town, to grab whatever supplies I could loot from unguarded businesses. Just as I had reached town, I saw them gathered in the middle of the road, looking up at something strung to a streetlight. There were people caught in one of those hunter nets meant to trap large game. Their wails of terror had filled the night as the three of them had been slowly lowered to the ground and promptly ripped to shreds at the hands of those monsters. They had taken their time, seeming to bask in the horror and degradation as they killed them one by one. I couldn't look away. Something within me refused to believe it was even real. I had seen terrible shit on TV before. But watching your neighbors laugh and shout in delight as they remove the organs of people you once shopped side by side with was a whole new ball game. It didn't stop there. The evidence of their rampages was more and more apparent as you snuck down the streets. There were stores that had been burnt to the ground. Others splattered with blood and gore. There were clear stains on the street where you could see victims had tried to flee before being drugged into whatever hell was awaiting them. I didn't even make it to the store before I turned and ran all the way back to my house. Nothing could have prepared me for what I saw that day. Nothing could erase the memory of those horrific things I'd witnessed or the shit I would continue to see every time. I gathered the courage to leave my home. I'm stuck. Utterly stuck in my decaying cabin. I can't trust the water anymore because I'm almost... a hundred percent sure where it came from. It would be the only explanation for the gator washing up with the disease a day before it affected our first town folk. I have enough food to last for a while, but it's not food I'm worried about. It's the water. Even with my stockpile, I'll only last the next month or so. I know what some of you are going to say. Get the fuck out of there. Take your truck and speed right out of town limits before your claim to. It's too late for that. I saw the trucks arrive not hours ago. The barrier is set up in record time. Anyone brave enough to go near them gets snatched up by the men in yellow. A shot right between the eyes. I know well enough about our government to know those who got taken won't end up well and safe on the other side. I beg of you, if you have any information I could use to help myself out in this situation, please tell me. I'm running out of options here, and I don't know how far this has gone. 
I suppose some of you are going to be disappointed with me. After all, there's no good end to this story. I wish I could tell you everything turned out fine in the end and I used all those survival tips to flee into the woods, but I hardly had enough time to read them before the end had already begun. Things had gone south since I last posted, and I, like the disease, it happened fast. It was like something sparked in the air, catching all at once and starting the blaze that would end it all. It was rain. A storm so thick you'd end up soaked just by looking at it. I knew it was the end, even before it wet the very earth on which I stood. There is something I should admit, I'm not entirely immune, as some of you might have thought. I just haven't been claimed by the rage the others seem to have fallen victim to. My veins went black, but my head remained the same, a cool 98 degrees on the thermometer. I thought for a moment, even with the sickness taking root in every corner of my body, that I might somehow be fine, that I was just not affected like the others. But then there was the pull. It had seated itself right on the back of my brain, whispering to my consciousness with every hour that went past. I couldn't make out the words, but I could feel the impact they had on my mind as each time I felt the caress of its shadowed touch, I find myself leaving my own mind for a split second. Sometimes it was so strong, I'd find myself opening my eyes what seemed like a split second after last closing them, standing in the water right outside my house, staring empty down into its inky depths. It was part of the reason why I hadn't joined up with any of the other survivors. Well that and there was no way I was going to trust them when half of them were willing to put a bullet in an innocent if there was even the slight amount of question about their behavior. I didn't even want to think about what might happen. If I had the guts to approach one of those men in yellow, stealing people right off the streets, they never took the survivors. They weren't here to rescue us or to try and help us survive. Within our town's quarantine, they stole the infected and they shot anyone who thought might interfere. Perhaps it was luck, or just some sort of twisted fate. But I had seen them in action, speeding into town in their armored little vans, and grabbing the infected one by one. One of the ones they had taken had been the cashier from day one. I almost wanted to laugh. Look out for the sick, she had said. Famous last words. As much as I wanted to, I knew the best option for me was to remain hidden until something drastically changed and I was forced to relocate. Unfortunately for us all, that something was the rain. Something drew me out of the house that day. That voice in my mind calling me to come into the open and see what it had in store for me. I didn't think of my safety, nor much of anything else. It was a mindless gut feeling that had me putting one foot in front of the other. Until I was standing right in front of the section of town that had housed the rest of the survivors. Most of them had made their homes in the town hall. The only stone and brick building in the next ten miles that could potentially protect them from a threat like this. It had been a smart idea. Being as it's not easy to burn down a brick building made it even smarter with the obvious defenses they had set up. Though it hadn't been enough if my being brought there meant anything. The doors were wide open. Tables and barriers spilled out its large entryway. Blood oozed out of the building. Its impossibly bright red color, making still fresh stains on the pristine white steps. I didn't want to go in. I didn't want to see. But whatever burned in my skull didn't care about my wants. It drugged me step by step into the building until I stood right in the center of the storm. Right in the center of the screams. They were everywhere. On the walls, in the rafters. Hundreds of infected sat laughing around the ring in the center of the room where the blood ran thickest. It was a bone-chilling laughter. One of pure madness and glee. There was only one survivor left. A man, 
unfamiliar to me, lay on the center of the floor. I won't describe what they had done to him, for I would rather not inflict that terrible knowledge on anyone else. I will say, though, that there was no way the man should have been alive. Not with as little of him as there was left. Still he was. Eyes wide and mouth open in an endless silent scream. The blood in his mouth muted anything he might have been trying to say, but I doubted he could have done anything other than to beg for mercy at that moment. I was almost sick. Almost. If what I saw hadn't numbed me, I might have fallen to my knees and wretched my guts out. But I was already long past that. I only watched, feeling nothing but numbness and pity as my ears began to burn. For some reason, they did not attack me. Maybe because they sensed the illness that had already consumed my body. Maybe they were so distracted with the show, they didn't care. Either way, it wasn't a blessing. I would have preferred death. Over watching them make playthings of the bodies of the last strugglers left of the town survivors. I don't know how long I kept going through the downpour until I found myself staring down one of the couple exit roads our town has. It was one of the places where the barricades had been set up. This one larger and made mostly for the purpose of keeping the diseased in and those fortunate enough not to be caught in the massacre out. Only when I got there, it was completely void of any meaningful life. No men in yellow. No military guards. Not a single sign of life. That is, apart from the black veins. I can see them standing there, completely still as if they all were listening for any movement. Only one acknowledged my arrival, its blind white eyes snapping up to me. It remained like that, completely still as it monitored my movements. All of the black veins I've seen as of late had been doing exactly that. Standing still. Listening. Hunting. How many poor uninfected souls had fallen victim to them, I wondered. How was it I hadn't? I had a million questions, all burning like a hot iron through my quickly overheating mind. As much as I wondered, I knew the answer. I felt the answer burning bright right behind my eyes. I don't know if this has spread, or how I made it this long, but it hardly matters. It's over now. Time is ticking for me. This I know. I already see my veins and my arms darkening even further with the illness. I feel my, my very humanity peeling away like layers from an onion. Soon, there will be little left of me but the vessel that is my body. I couldn't take the injustice of it all. I didn't do anything to deserve this. I stayed in the shadows. I didn't talk to anyone. I followed the rules and did as my father asked, and I never got into trouble. I was a good kid. So why is my mind filling with those sickening thoughts? I see him now as I sit at my computer chronicling what I know is the final moments of my sanity. He's standing out in the woods, completely still as he looks directly through my window, right to where I sit. It's as if he knows what's come over me. Maybe he knew from the start, and he's just been waiting this whole time for me to realize it too. One thing I did think was weird that I thought you should know before I log off for good was that he wasn't alone. None of them were. They had never been. Look out for the shadows. That's where they go to hide. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights It's terrible. What they say have an old Jack Greer. Terrible, but we really can't say that he should have been surprised. 
living alone up there on the mountain during the dead of winter. It was a fool's errand, and we all told him as much. The mountain is a strange place, especially when the weather takes a turn and none of us ever hunt up there alone or for any longer than three days. But Jack was strange in the head, a loner, a rebel, self-sufficient, he said, independent, he said, but the old women in town called him a damn fool. And when they found him after the thaw and what he had been cooking and eating on the night that it happened, well, it proved him right. See, old Jack didn't like society, and he spent nearly all his time in the cabin his great-grandpappy built on the leeward side of the ridge, under the shadows of the flint wall where the snow piles into wispy tufts that look like pointed teeth in a lower jaw. That's why it's called Jawbone Ridge, if you hadn't guessed. Most of us hunts in the summertime for sport, and in the fall to feed our young ones, but we stay home during the winter. The ridge is treacherous once November starts brewing, and if you get caught up there when the weather turns, well, probably won't go well for you. The whole lee side of the mountain is a graveyard, holding the bones of dozens of men who dallied up there alone, and even a few who went up there in parties and tried to play it smart. It's like the sea, vast and merciless, and not giving up her dead, as the preachers say until the resurrection. There's some who even doubt that the Lord will be able to pry those corpses out of the mountain's jealous grip. And so when October came, we went out hunting in parties, brought back deer and hares and possums and coons, and our women folks skinned them and dried them in the smoker so as we could have meat over the long winter. And old Jack Greer went up there too. But he didn't go with just a gun and a haversack. He filled up his big wooden barrel with supplies and had his three hounds at his heels and a big bulging knapsack weighing him down. His gun was slung over one arm and his axe was tucked under the other and, and we saw he had parts for a still hidden under the tarp covering his barrel. Well enough, his great-grandpappy built that cabin as a moonshining base. He was covered in furs even though it was warm. October afternoon, and that's how we knew he meant to stay there well into the winter, maybe longer. He didn't say a word to any of us as he went up the trail and split off into separate ways. Johnny Aberdeen was the last to see him, lugging his barrow into the hills, the three dogs close behind, the sun sinking into shadow. Old Betty McAllister has a witching touch, they say. She's not gone over to the darkness, we don't think, but... When her grandmammy came over the hills from the old country, her great-grandparents heard that her grandmammy, Betty's great-grandmammy, had been strung up for a witch. Well, she goes to Sunday meeting, and she says the Lord's Prayer and says it well. But she has a touch of the uncouth about her. Some say she has a second sight. She's old as dust indeed, and remembers all the lore of the mountain. And when she dreamed about old Jack Greer that third week of December, nigh a month after the big blizzard snowed us off from the valley, we knew something had happened. And when the snows thawed the week after Epiphany, we sent a party of men to find him. And when they found him, we remembered what old Betty McAllister dreamed. The hunters returned with hares and coons and some does and a buck, but old Jack stayed where he was. Johnny Aberdeen says he saw smoke coming from the lee side under Jawbone Ridge, and we know old Jack was fixing to stay up there for a while. Halloween come past, and old Jack stayed put. The election day came. Jack didn't come down from the hills to vote. Thanksgiving came, and the hunters went out to fetch turkeys from the thickets. And they said they saw smoke coming up in curls from Jawbone Ridge. Still alive. Still staying put. But the day after Thanksgiving, the weather shifted. The clouds were an off color, grayish green, dark with snow. Betty figures that Jack was stuck in his cabin up there under the ridge, even though he had the lee. She tells us he was expecting bad weather, so it didn't trouble him. But she also says that his food ran out by the second week of the advent, 
and when she told us the rest, we knew he was dead. Snowed in with his dogs, he was. He could force his way out about a quarter mile if he absolutely had to, but it was risky moving about in the snow with the winds shifting the banks and knocking over trees without warning, so he mostly stayed put. There weren't any deer to be found or coons to be grabbed. He was just there with the three dogs, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The dogs were his kin, as far as he was concerned. And he was looking out for food for them as much as himself, bringing in a few squirrels at first, then catching some mice in the house and boiling roots and walnuts for broth. It was out of the question to put the hounds to the axe, but time was running out for all four of them. It was a few days since they'd had bite, just melted snow to drink. When we think he first saw it, it was the most curious critter he'd ever laid eyes on, just scuffling in the shadows of the far side of the cabin, chasing some beetle or moth as if it were the only creature in the room. The hounds watched it warily, because it was foreign to them too and had the look of a queer bogey. It was black all over and half the size of any of the hounds, something like a cat. And it looked like a cat, too, with pointed tufted ears and great golden eyes that flashed green in the shadows. But it wasn't a cat. Not like the one that old Betty keeps and has been keeping for nigh twenty years. Strange, unaging tomcat it is, too, because its paws were clumsy and large, the size of apples and it flourished a great shaggy tail, black as coal, and twice the length of its spine. The creature pounced on the moth or beetle and delighted at the sight of its victory. With a casual glance, it finally looked over at old Jack. Old Jack saw its eyes, wide and glowing like two embers smoldering in a hearth. Blinked twice at him before it turned back to the crushed insect under its ungainly paw, Old Jack reached over for his gun, handled it gently, and with the slowest movement you ever did see, without even standing up from his chair, he held the stock against his shoulder and leveled the tube at the bogey. He rested his thumb on the hammer and slowly pulled it back with a hollow steel click. The bogey's eyes suddenly rose with a jerk. They were staring right at him. Jack tilted the barrel so that it was pointed directly between the eyes, and he pulled the trigger tight with a sudden jerk. The cap snapped and a whiff of powder stung his nostrils, but the main charge hadn't gone off. He sat there, hanging in fire until he realized that the powder had probably been ruined by the snow while he was foraging that morning. He set the rifle down. His axe was leaning against the woodpile at his elbow. Two eyes watched him unblinkingly. They blazed with fear and wonder. Old Jack was losing patience, we figured, because now he didn't take it slow. He grabbed that axe by the very end of the hickory handle and swung out at the two eyes like he was holding a saber. The bogey jumped into action, racing up the wall, along the ceiling, down the other side, along the floor, scrambling wildly like a salamander, scuttling nimbly as he dodged Jack's frantic blows. The hounds backed off and watched with wide eyes. The creature was on the floor, running madly for the fireplace. A clump of pine brands were snapping with large, white and blue flames, but it didn't seem to care. It was making a mad dash for the chimney. And then it was among the fire and through it and going up, and old Jack knew it was now or never. And by God, he swung out. The bogey rushed up the chimney but its long black tail had been severed at the base and was tumbling into the fire. None of it could be wasted, so he reached in the flames and recovered the bogey's tail. Compared to roots and nuts, the prospect of boiling the tail in a broth must have seemed like a feast, so he quickly melted a kettle of snow, skinned the member, and boiled away the meat and sinew. There were a few dried herbs left in his haversack, a couple of bay leaves and some sprigs of rosemary. He added these to the brew along with some snips of wild garlic that he found growing in the dirt floor by the door, rendered an oily pungent broth that filled the cabin with greasy steam. He greedily slurped down half a cup of the soup, chewing the bones into pulp and sucking out the marrow. He gave the rest to the dogs who sniffed it, but they refused to even try it. 
He finished what was left, and as the wind pounded its way across Jawbone Ridge overhead, he was thankful to be on the lee side, where he was safe and warm. And now, finally, full. The fire guttered as the wind moaned across the chimney top, scattering red sparks in the fireplace like flakes in a snow globe. He doused the lantern, leaving only the molten glare of the three smoldering logs in the fireplace and climbed the ladder to the loft which made up his bedroom. He had created a very comfortable bed there out of bearskins and beaver pelts, piled on top of a bed of fresh hay that he changed every couple of months. He slept on top of this under two camp blankets that he had from his stint in the army, and a quilt that his grandmammy had made to keep her kids warm on the boat over from Ulster during the Great Famine. It was as warm as he could hope for. His belly was heavy with the soup, and even though he hadn't been able to have any bread or potatoes with it, he felt full. And the flavor hadn't been bad either, rather like pork trimming stew. He listened to the fire snap below him and fell asleep. When he woke up, it was because of the angry scratching at the door. The embers had died to a white ash with only a few lingering eyes glaring up at him from the grate. He sat up for a spell, listening to the noise. It was intentional, all right. Like the sound of a dog shut up in a room trying to force the door open with a combination of his claws and throwing his entire heft against the door. But somehow it sounded smaller. No, it wasn't a dog at all. And where were his dogs? There, there in the corner, bristling and shaking and staring at the rattling door. Old Jack Greer wasn't afraid of a rabbit coon or a hungry cat, or even that queer bogey whose tail had just filled his belly with warm comfort. He reached for his rifle, but remembered the spoiled powder. He would have to draw the charge eventually, but in the meantime, he grabbed the axe. Still had a brown smear up the middle of the blade where the tail had been severed. He gripped it by the middle of the handle and threw open the door. Nothing was there. Just a howling black gulf unbrightened by stars or moon. The only light came from the oil lantern in his left hand, which threw a severe red glare on the dusty snow, shifting from bank to bank outside his door. But there were prints in the snow, near his feet. Large, awkward paw prints. Strangely close together, resembling the marks of a house cat, but heavier, almost wolf-like in their heft. He walked around the door, holding the axe even tighter. The outside planks had been lacerated viciously. The old, gray, weather-beaten skin was stripped with deep yellow gashes. Up and down, crisscross, webbing wildly as if some desperate person with a straight razor had been trying to slash his way inside. Long, gray, corkscrew peels of wood lay in front of the door like the cast-offs of a carpenter's shop. As he stared down at the ravaged wood, he heard a frantic clatter and glanced over his shoulder just in time to see the three hounds. Their bodies freckled with lamplight, barging through the door and down the path into the deadly snow. They had stayed with him through harsh or starving times, had saved him from the attacks of two bears, three wolves, and one bobcat. They were scored with gnarled white scars from their combats, and were disciplined from age, experience, and hardship. And yet they ran, away from him, away from the kettle that stank of the bogey's tail stew, away from the lacerated door. And while old Jack Greer stared after them into the formless blackness that closed in around the defensive light of his lamp, he heard something. At first, he thought it was the flight of some ghastly, heavy insect, or the unseasonal groan of a cicada, or the rasp of the door on its hinges. It was a voice. However, a horrible, horrible voice. Harsh, gargled and inhuman, simultaneously hoarse and deep, frail and raspy, like that of a bitter old woman or a sleepy young boy. It growled at him from somewhere overhead. The 
Her words meant nothing to Jack Greer, other than the vague allusion to a tale coupled with a childish sense of fond endearment. Looking into the trees above, he thought he caught a glimpse of two green cinders blazing in the dark, but in a wink, they were gone. He quickly went inside with his axe and his lamp and closed the door tightly. He barred it with shaken hands and instantly went to his rifle and nervously began to take it apart. He turned the knob on the lamp, raising the wick and casting more light around the dusty cabin. A ghostly, green-white light that threw a heavy brown shadow. Out came the barrel, away from the stock, and there in the breech was a wet charge of powder like a lump of clay. He cast it into the fire where the sulfur sizzled and released brown smoke. He had just slid the barrel back in place and clamped it tight when he heard a faint, playful scratch on the door. His heart seemed to stop. There was his ammunition bag off to the side with his dry paper cartridges and the chance to defend himself. The scratching suddenly picked up tempo and volume clattering in his ears while the door rattled against the jams. He grabbed a dry cartridge, bit the end off, and poured the powder down the barrel, then the greased bullet, and then he rammed them home, the metallic jangle of the ramrod responding to the heavy pound of the shuttering door. And as he fumbled to apply the cap to his gun lock, he heard, muffled but strong, the same raspy moan. Without a second thought, he aimed at the spot in the door where a few thin streaks of black night were showing through the savage wood and pulled the trigger. The charge exploded smartly. The ball punched through the wood and into the night. The door stopped jostling. There was no voice on the other side. He waited for a response, but none came. He stared at the door for what seemed like a quarter of an hour. Nothing happened. Old Jack was a good hunter with strong nerves, but he had never wanted to be in town right now as much as he did in this moment. He settled the gun against the wall and warily trudged up the ladder to his loft. He laid down on the pelts and pulled the blankets up to his jaw. He fell asleep almost immediately, but was troubled by dreams of toothless witches and grinning goblins and skeletons jigging in graveyards. <laughs> He was woken up by the crash of wood. At first he thought it was a ghoul breaking through the top of a coffin to gorge on the gray flesh hidden beneath. But when he looked up, he realized where he was and that the door had been successfully breached. Perhaps the bogey had been clawing at it for hours, or perhaps it had just flung its tiny body at the gadge boards a few times before one gave away. He reached out to his side. There was no rifle. It was downstairs. There was no razor-sharp axe. It was on the woodpile. There was no hunting knife. It was in the ammunition bag. He gripped the quilt desperately. He had left the oil lamp burning, apparently, because a ghostly light the color of spoiled cream was faintly lapping at the wall opposite him, and the ladder stood silhouetted against it black and stark like the iron rail of a cemetery. The light was pale and weak, but he could detect shadows moving around it, as if something were walking around the room below him, searching. He thought to himself that the bogey would probably not be able to climb the ladder, and for a moment, he felt safe. He had to bite his tongue to keep from crying out, however when he saw something black and cat-like climbing up the cabin wall with the speed and comfort of a salamander. Its hefty paws splayed like starfish, its head wheeling about from side to side like a blind man's cane. Its hindquarters sported about three inches of tail, a stump that was gruesomely twitching back and forth from what Jack imagined must be the excitement of anticipation or the thrill of revenge. And then, the knobby head swiveled like an owl's, 
Jack found himself staring into its molten green gaze. Quick as a flash, its jaws opened. Its mouth was purplish red with long yellow teeth, and a voice seemed to roll from its throat. Jack moaned. It's gone. All gone. It's, it's eaten. You can't have her back. The bogey slithered frantically up the wall to the ceiling, across the ceiling until it was over the loft, and then it let go and fell to the floor in front of Jack's bed. There was a pregnant moment of anticipation, and then he saw two pointed, tufted black ears slowly rise between his feet, followed by a furry, round head and two gleaming green eyes. I done told you, Jack pleaded. I ain't got no more. I ain't got your taily pole. It's all gone. Boiled to soup and, and ate. I'm sorry, I don't got it. The eyes didn't blink. The head tilted curiously until it was almost perpendicular to its body, watching old Jack sideways. Its purple tongue lolled out of its mouth and the eyes sparkled. Daily bow! Daily bow! You've got my daily bow! But I just told you, I don't! Something seemed to click in Jack Greer's brain. The bogey was a loner, like him, a rebel, too. A stubborn, independent, self-reliant survivor, and, and he was also just as vindictive and just as unforgiving. It took just a moment for the grinning face to disappear under the blankets. Jack felt it slither towards him, felt its soft fur rub along his inner legs, and felt its front paws pressing into his groin, onto his gut, and steady themselves just below his ribcage. It was purring and he loathed the vibrations that rumbled beneath the blanket, just as he loathed the wetness that was spreading down his pants and the girlish pleas that exploded from his throat as the bogey's talons shot through his abdomen and slid him open with a single quick stroke. Then again, 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 through the belly to the spine, then to the throat and down down, down to the pelvis, then under the ribs to the lung, to the heart, to the stomach. Its fur was heavy with gore, its mouth was dripping and red, and with one casual slice, it ripped the stomach to ribbons, just as you'd slice open the plastic wrap on a chicken breast with a flick of a steak knife and the black bile and blood soaked the blankets and spilled to the floor and dripped to the ground. We followed old Betty's vision faithfully and we found that most of what she said was true. We found the three dogs, mad with fear, at the house of a farmer in the valley. He fed them when they came down the mountain, but says he doesn't think they'll ever be good hunting dogs again. He wondered at that when he saw the scars from bears and wolves and says they must have had a terrible shock. We found the cabin with its doors gouged and sliced the ribbons. A hole the size of a man's head had been punched through the center of the mutilations. We had to break it down with axes because it was barred from the inside. We found a bullet hole in the door near the gash and a spent cartridge on the floor. The lamp was burned dry on the table and the axe near the fireplace was dark with bloodstains. And there was the man himself in his bed, stone dead, face white as paper, clawed it with putrid gore, ripped open from gullet to groin. We still talk about old Jack Rear and the terrible thing that was done to him four years ago when the blizzard caught him unawares 
and he was stuck up on Jawbone Ridge with the thing that opened him up like a fish. We don't know if old Betty's dream is all true, but young Johnny Aberdeen was up on the ridge last November, hunting turkeys for the Thanksgiving dinner, when he came upon a black thicket of ash trees under the shadow of the Flint Cliff, where you can see your breath in the shade, even in the summertime. He was resting his gun against an ancient old beech, was reaching into his haversack for a bit of black bread when he heard something above him. It was rattly and wispy, like the flight of a huge beetle, but he swore it was speaking. When he told us what he'd heard, we all said that it all tied together, and now none of us go hunting alone on Jawbone Ridge. Not even for an afternoon. Up there, high in the ashes, he heard it whisper, happy and smug. Daddy Bo. Daddy Bo. You got my Daddy Bo. Chilling tales for dark nights.